Chapter Five of The Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsty. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stendhal. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Five A Negotiation. Cunctando restituit rem. Ineus. Answer me without lies if you can, you damned dog. How did you get to know Madame de Renal? When did you speak to her? I have never spoken to her, answered Julian. I have only seen that lady in church. You must have looked at her, you impudent rascal. Not once. You know I only see God in church, answered Julian, with a little hypocritical air, well suited, so he thought, to keep off the parental claws. Nonetheless, there's something that does not meet the eye, answered the cunning peasant. He was then silent for a moment. But I shall never get anything out of you, you damned hypocrite, he went on. As a matter of fact, I am going to get rid of you, and my sawmill will go all the better for it. You have nobbled the curate or somebody else who has got you a good place. Run along and pack your traps, and I will take you to Monsieur de Renal's, where you are going to be a tutor to his children. What shall I get for that? Board, clothing, and three hundred francs salary. I do not want to be a servant. Who's talking of being a servant, you brute? Do you think I want my son to be a servant? But with whom shall I have my meals? This question discomforted old Sorel, who felt he might possibly commit some imprudence if he went on talking. He burst out against Julian, flung insult after insult at him, accused him of gluttony, and left him to go and consult his other sons. Julian saw them afterwards, each one leaning on his axe and holding counsel. Having looked at them for a long time, Julian saw that he could find out nothing, and went and stationed himself on the other side of the saw in order to avoid being surprised. He wanted to think over this unexpected piece of news which changed his whole life, but he felt himself unable to consider the matter prudently, his imagination being concentrated in wondering what he would see in Monsieur de Renal's fine mansion. "'I must give all that up,' he said to himself rather than let myself be reduced to eating with the servants. My father would like to force me to it. I would rather die. I have fifteen francs and eight sous of savings. I will run away to-night. I will go across country by paths where there are no gendarmes to be feared. And in two days I shall be at Besançon. I will enlist as a soldier there, and, if necessary, I will cross into Switzerland. But in that case, no more advancement. It will be all up with my being a priest, that fine career which may lead to anything. This abhorrence of eating with the servants was not really natural to Julien. He would have done things quite, if not more, disagreeable in order to get on. He derived this repugnance from the Confessions of Rousseau. It was the only book by whose help his imagination endeavoured to construct the world. The collection of the bulletins of the Grand Army and the memorial of St. Helena completed his Koran. He would have died for these three works. He never believed in any other. To use a phrase of the old surgeon major, he regarded all the other books in the world as packs of lies, written by rogues in order to get on. Julian possessed both a fiery soul and one of those astonishing memories which are so often combined with stupidity. In order to win over the old curé Chalon, on whose good grace he realised that his future prospects depended, he had learned by heart the New Testament in Latin. He also knew Monsieur de Maistre's book on the Pope, and believed in one as little as he did in the other. Sorel and his son avoided talking to each other today, as though by mutual consent. In the evening, Julian went to take his theology lesson at the curé's, but he did not consider that it was prudent to say anything to him about the strange proposal which had been made to his father. "'It is possibly a trap,' he said to himself. "'I must pretend that I have forgotten all about it.' Early next morning, Monsieur de Renal had old Sorel summoned to him. 
he eventually arrived after keeping monsieur de renal waiting for an hour and a half and made as he entered the room a hundred apologies interspersed with as many bows after having run the gauntlet of all kinds of objections sorel was given to understand that his son would have his meals with the master and mistress of the house and that he would eat alone in a room with the children on the days when they had company the more clearly sorel realized the genuine eagerness of monsieur the maire the more difficulties he felt inclined to raise being moreover full of mistrust and astonishment he asked to see the room where his son would sleep it was a big room quite decently furnished into which the servants were already engaged in carrying the beds of the three children this circumstance explained a lot to the old peasant he asked immediately with quite an air of assurance to see the suit which would be given to his son monsieur de renal opened his desk and took out one hundred francs your son will go to monsieur durand the draper with this money and will get a complete black suit and even supposing i take him away from you said the peasant who had suddenly forgot all his respectful formalities will he still keep this black suit certainly well said sorel in a drawling voice all that remains to do is to agree on just one thing the money which you will give him what exclaimed monsieur de renal indignantly we agreed on that yesterday i shall give him three hundred francs i think that is a lot and probably too much that is your offer and i do not deny it said old sorel still speaking very slowly and by a stroke of genius which will only astonish those who do not know the franche comte peasants he fixed his eyes on monsieur de renal and added we shall get better terms elsewhere the mayor's face exhibited the utmost consternation at these words he pulled himself together however and after a cunning conversation of two hours length where every single word on both sides was carefully weighed the subtlety of the peasant scored a victory over the subtlety of the rich man whose livelihood was not so dependent on his faculty of cunning all the numerous stipulations which were to regulate julien's new existence were duly formulated not only was his salary fixed at four hundred francs but they were to be paid in advance on the first of each month very well i will give him thirty-five francs said monsieur de renal i am quite sure said the peasant in a fawning voice that a rich generous man like the monsieur maire would go as far as thirty-six francs to make up a good round sum agreed said monsieur de renal but let this be final for the moment his temper gave him a tone of genuine firmness the peasant saw that it would not do to go any further then on his side monsieur de renal managed to score he absolutely refused to give old sorel who was very anxious to receive it on behalf of his son the thirty-six francs for the first month it had occurred to monsieur de renal that he would have to tell his wife the figure which he had cut throughout these negotiations hand me back the hundred francs which i gave you he said sharply monsieur durand owes me something i will go with your son to see about a black cloth suit after this manifestation of firmness sorel had the prudence to return to his respectful formulas they took a good quarter of an hour finally seeing that there was nothing more to be gained he took his leave he finished his last bow with these words i will send my son to the chateau the mayor's officials called his house by this designation when they wanted to humour him when he got back to his workshop it was in vain that sorel sought his son suspicious of what might happen julien had gone out in the middle of the night he wished to place his cross of the legion of honour and his books in a place of safety he had taken everything to a young wood merchant named fouquet who was a friend of his and who lived in the high mountain which commands verrieres god knows you damn lazy bones said his father to him when he reappeared if you will ever be sufficiently honourable to pay me back the price of your board which i have been advancing to you for so many years take your rags and clear out to monsieur the mayor's julien was astonished at not being beaten 
and hastened to leave. He had scarcely got out of sight of his terrible father when he slackened his pace. He considered that it would assist the role played by his hypocrisy to go and say a prayer in the church. The word hypocrisy surprises you? The soul of the peasant had had to go through a great deal before arriving at this horrible word. Julian had seen, in the days of his early childhood, certain dragoons of the sixth. Note. The author was sub-lieutenant in the sixth dragoons in 1800. End note with long white cloaks and hats covered with long black plumed helmets who were returning from Italy and tied up their horses to the grilled window of his father's house. The sight had made him mad on the military profession. Later on he had listened with ecstasy to the narrations of the battles of Lodi, Acola and Rivoli with which the old surgeon major had regaled him. He observed the ardent gaze which the old man used to direct towards his cross. But when Julian was fourteen years of age, they commenced to build a church at Verrier, which, in view of the smallness of the town, has some claim to be called magnificent. There were four marble columns in particular, the sight of which impressed Julian. They became celebrated in the district owing to the mortal hate which they raised between the justice of the peace and the young vicar who had been sent from Besançon, and who was passed for a spy of the congregation. The justice of the peace was on the point of losing his place, so said the public opinion at any rate. He had not dared to have a difference with the priest who went every fortnight to Besançon, where he saw, so they said, my lord bishop. In the meanwhile, the justice of the peace, who was the father of a numerous family, gave several sentences which seemed unjust. All these sentences were inflicted on those of the inhabitants who read the Constitutionnel. The right party triumphed. It is true it was only a question of sums of three or five francs, but one of these little fines had to be paid by a nail-maker, who was godfather to Julien. This man exclaimed in his anger, What a change, and to think that for more than twenty years the justice of the peace has passed for an honest man. The surgeon major, Julien's friend, died. Suddenly Julien left off talking about Napoleon. He announced his intention of becoming a priest, and was always to be seen in his father's workshop occupied in learning by heart the Latin Bible, which the curé had lent him. The good old man was astonished at his progress, and passed whole evenings in teaching him theology. In his society Julian did not manifest other than pious sentiments. Who could not possibly guess that beneath this girlish face, so pale and so sweet, lurked the unbreakable resolution to risk a thousand deaths rather than fail to make his fortune. Making his fortune primarily meant to Julien getting out of Verrier. He abhorred his native country. Everything that he saw there froze his imagination. He had moments of exultation since his earliest childhood. He would then dream with gusto of being presented one day to the pretty women of Paris. He would manage to attract their attention by some dazzling feat. Why should he not be loved by one of them just as Bonaparte, when still poor, had been loved by the brilliant Madame de Beauharnais? For many years past, Julien had barely passed a single year of his life without reminding himself that Bonaparte, the obscure and penniless lieutenant, had made himself master of the whole world by the power of his sword. This idea consoled him for his misfortune, which he considered to be great, and rendered such joyful moments as he had doubly intense. The building of the church and the sentences pronounced by the justice of the peace suddenly enlightened him. An idea came to him which made him almost mad for some weeks, and finally took complete possession of him with all the magic that a first idea possesses for a passionate soul which believes that it is original. At the time when Bonaparte got himself talked about, France was frightened of being invaded. Military distinction was necessary and fashionable. Nowadays one sees priests of forty with salaries of one hundred thousand francs, that is to say three times as much as Napoleon's famous generals of a division. They need persons to assist them. Look at that justice of the peace, 
such a good sort and such an honest man up to the present and so old too he sacrifices his honour through the fear of incurring the displeasure of a young vicar of thirty i must be a priest on one occasion in the middle of his new-found piety he had already been studying theology for two years he was betrayed by a sudden burst of fire which consumed his soul it was at monsieur chelan's the good curé had invited him to a dinner of priests and he actually let himself praise napoleon with enthusiasm he bound his right arm over his breast pretending that he had dislocated it in moving a trunk of a pine tree and carried it for two months in that painful position after this painful penance he forgave himself this is the young man of eighteen with a puny physique and scarcely looking more than seventeen at the outside who entered the magnificent church of verrier carrying a little parcel under his arm he found it gloomy and deserted all the transepts in the building had been covered with crimson cloth in celebration of a feast the result was that the sun's rays produced an effect of dazzling light of the most impressive and religious character julien shuddered finding himself alone in the church he established himself in the pew which had the most magnificent appearance it bore the arms of monsieur de renal julien noticed a piece of printed paper spread out on the stool which was apparently intended to be read he cast his eyes over it and saw details of the execution and the last moments of louis jean Rel, executed at besançon the the paper was torn the first words of a line were legible on the back they were the first step who could have put this paper there said julien poor fellow he added with a sigh the last syllable of his name is the same as mine and he crumpled up the paper as he left julien thought he saw blood near the host it was holy water which the priests had been sprinkling on it the reflection of the red curtains which covered the windows made it look like blood finally julien felt ashamed of his secret terror am i going to play the coward he said to himself to arms this phrase repeated so often in the old surgeon major's battle stories symbolized heroism to julien he got up rapidly and walked to monsieur de renal's house as soon as he saw it twenty yards in front of him he was seized in spite of his fine resolution with an overwhelming timidity the iron grill was open he thought it was magnificent he had to go inside Julian was not the only person whose heart was troubled by his arrival in the house. The extreme timidity of Madame de Renal was fluttered when she thought of this stranger, whose functions would necessitate his coming between her and her children. She was accustomed to seeing her son sleep in her own room. She had shed many tears that morning when she had seen their beds carried into the apartment intended for the tutor it was in vain that she asked her husband to have the bed of stanislas xavier the youngest carried back into her room womanly delicacy was carried in madame de renal to the point of excess she conjured up in her imagination the most disagreeable personage who was coarse badly groomed and in charge with the duty of scolding her children simply because he happened to know latin and only too ready to flog her sons for their ignorance of that barbarous language end of chapter 5 a negotiation recording by kirsty